Well, hello! Welcome to another Ruby video essay. This particular topic was voted as my next video essay on Patreon. Hop over there if you want to see in what the hell I do next, or just stay here for the ride. So if you've been in the YouTube fandom for a while, you probably remember a swathe of videos criticising and tearing the character of Ruby Rose to shreds in Volume 4, and particularly Volume 5. And I, unlike some recent criticism of the series, agreed with this wholeheartedly. Ruby had never been my favourite character out of the main four girls. She'd always placed at the bottom of my rankings against wife Blake and Yang. That's not to say I didn't enjoy her character in Volumes 1-3, the same way I did Ren, Nora and Penny and Pyrrha, but she was never a standout, which is concerning for a show's titular character. They should carry and drive the plot not simply be a passenger along for the ride. But hey, I could live with all that because Ruby's lack of agency or depth as a character wasn't such a glaring issue until the show took a more serious tone post Volume 3. If Ruby was a passenger to the plot from Volumes 1 to 3, she might as well have been tied under the train and dragged against the tracks during Volume 4 and 5. If you think I'm exaggerating about how much I started to really not like Ruby during that time, have a look at my Ruby figure shelf. I bought Weiss, Blake and Yang at RTX London, but not Ruby. I just wasn't willing to spend my money on a character I really didn't like at that point. Just ignore Cinder standing here in the villain circle. I didn't pay for that lifeless husk masquerading as a character. Sany did, and god am I a slut for symmetry so I guess Cinder has to stay there, lest I endure the wrath of my wife. So, back to the duality of one Ruby Rose. I suppose in order to explain to you why I feel Volume 6 saved Ruby's character, I need to explain what she needed saving from in the first place. So let me briefly skirt over who the hell Ruby was in Volumes 1 to 3. She was an absolute optimist, socially awkward and naive. These were all pretty nice defining character traits during this era of the show, when the darkest themes the show would touch was the racial inequalities between human and faunus, which wasn't exactly explored with real gravitas. The most serious tone the show took before the last few episodes of Volume 3 was the Mountain Glen arc, the reveal that a city of people had been cut off from wider society and retreated underground to escape the Grimm. Where they had all eventually perished was genuinely horrifying, and made the Grimm intimidating, a force to be reckoned with. And uh, then this shit show happened at the end of Volume 2, for some unknown reason, which turned the Grimm into crash test dummies. God was watching Emerald and Mercury demolish Coco and Yatsuhashi cathartic after this shit show. But yes, back to Ruby. Ruby during this era was allowed to be naive and optimistic. She had lived a relatively sheltered life until going to Beacon, too young to remember Summer Rose and likely shielded from some of the world's darkness by her older sister. Ruby didn't have as many emotional hang-ups like Yang, my poor sunny child. This allowed her optimism and faith in the goodness of humanity to flourish, along with her desire to protect it. After all, as far as Ruby is concerned, Summer died at the hands of Grimm. Monsters, not humans. The conflicts between kingdoms is long past by the time she is born, and she doesn't see the true depths of cruelty humanity is capable of until Penny's death in Volume 3. Roman Torchwick is by far the worst person she has to confront in this time, but he's a career criminal. Not evil incarnate, and not particularly deadly in combat unlike his ice cream haired companion. The light tone of Volume 1 to 3 allowed this naivety and optimism to not grate on the audience. It worked, for the most part, and gave Ruby some genuinely nice moments, but nothing that ever stood out to me compared to the other members of her team, who were far better fleshed out, Weiss being the most obvious example. And it's why Weiss was able to go from hated prissy rich girl to the darling of the fandom. She was allowed to develop organically in the story. Any change in Weiss's character made sense within the themes of the plot and felt earned, which made it all the more enjoyable. When we jump to Volume 4, this dark tonal shift doesn't carry Ruby with it. 
She's effectively stuck in the poser era of the show until Volume 6 finally addresses the glaring problems with how Ruby was written. So what exactly were the big problems with Ruby in Volumes 4 and 5? This is absolute kryptonite to the main protagonist of the show. An ineffective protagonist is just as frustrating as an ineffective antagonist for the viewer. Ruby is a show driven by action and emotionally high stakes, so this lack of agency with Ruby is particularly killer. But I hear you cry, maybe that's the point with Volumes 4 and 5, that Ruby has no real control over the world. The ending of Volume 3 taught her that harsh lesson. Except there's a difference between a character's agency being hindered and threatened by events in the plot and a character being a total bystander in what is supposed to be their story. Sometimes a character with no real agency can work really well in media, with dystopian and bleak pieces like 1984, to reinforce the futility of the character's struggles. But Ruby has never struck me as that kind of show. It's always had elements of hope against adversity. Ruby is coded as a potential saviour of humanity against the Grimm, for crying out loud. She can't be that and also be the equivalent of a doormat in many scenes. Volume 5 is certainly more guilty of a lack of agency for Ruby than 4, but 4 still has its problems. This scene with Ruby and John mourning over Pyrrha was a showcase of this. John's pain is the focus, which I'm not too bothered by, but the fact that Ruby simply serves as a witness to John's turmoil kinda sucks. Ruby never confronts him over this unhealthy behaviour or tries to offer any comfort, maybe using her own losses to help reassure John. Hell, John doesn't get confronted for this behaviour until Volume 6 by Ren and Nora, and almost got himself killed by Cinder as a result. For Ruby, who is the de facto leader of Team Ranger, this is a low point. She honestly didn't even need to be in this scene and it wouldn't have made much of a difference to anything plot or character wise. The rest of the volume passes without Ruby doing much else, or addressing any of the turmoil she's feeling. Even when John confronts her about this, she really doesn't crumble much. This would have been an ideal point for Ruby to bring up that training scene from earlier in the volume to try and address John's behaviour and obvious pain, as well as her own, but nope. Jean reminds Ruby of all the things that she's lost to get here and Ruby's just kind of like, yeah, those things happened. We lost, we lost Pira. You lost her too. And Penny, and your team, and in a way, your sister. But you're still here. Despite everything you've lost and everything you could still lose, you chose to come out here because you felt like you could make a difference. You didn't drag us along. You gave us the courage to follow you. She plays a small role in the Nuclear V fight at the end of the volume. Big props. Although to be fair to her, that scene really belonged to Seren and Nora. Actually, the best part of Volume 4 for Ruby is her letter to Yang at the end of the volume. Which, again, kinda sucks since there isn't exactly much agency in sitting and writing a letter. Her de facto monologue of the volume's events. I know you told me it was a reckless idea and after everything I've been through, I can definitely say you were right. It's been hard on all of us. And I'm not just talking about the monsters we fought out here. Okay, you can hide out back in the cargo hold. I'll take you as far as I can, but if we get caught, you're on your own. Understand? Every step we made took us further and further away from the things we knew. And every morning we woke up wondering if just over the next hill would be something good something terrible. It's scary not knowing what's going to happen next. And the things we do know now, just how bad it can get, it almost makes it all worse. You told me once that bad things just happen. You were angry when you said it, and I didn't want to listen. But you were right. Bad things do happen. All the time. Every day. 
which is why I'm out here to do whatever I can, wherever I can, and hopefully do some good. It gives us an insight into Ruby's mind far more than she's shown to in the actual volume. Bad things happen all the time. If just some of the thoughts conveyed in this monologue had been injected into Ruby's actions and behaviours in the volume, it would have vastly improved her character, instead of being this passive figure during any of the volume's darker moments. Okay, so let's open up the train wreck that was Ruby's character in volume 5. Oh boy, I really don't know what happened with her in this volume, but I'm honestly struggling to remember what the hell she did off the top of my head. For everyone else, I can think of something pretty quickly. Why he summoned that Lancer and Sass Raven, absolute mad lad. Yang also sassed Raven, which was pretty great, and also kicked the shit out of these bandits. Blake set her own house on fire. That's some next level fucking agency, my dudes. I actually liked Blake's volume 5 plot, but putting that aside. Ruby. Ruby, what happened to you in that damn house? She literally became one of the fixtures. And no, not in a metaphorical she holds this house up way, but more like a misaligned painting on the wall that nobody really pays much attention to, but they know it's there. Here's what I have surmounted as Ruby's influence on anything in the volume. She asks Ozpin if his cane is a relic. It isn't. Cool. I'm sure there weren't more pressing questions to ask than that. She gives Oscar a pep talk, which I uh, don't hate, but it does come across as pretty unnatural for her to divulge all of this emotional pain on someone she has no meaningful relationship with at this point. Again, this scene would have resonated a little better if John had been in Oscar's place. John's frustration with Ruby's seemingly unwavering optimism despite everything would have been a really interesting source of potential conflict for the pair until the battle with Cinder and Co. And here's the last thing I can remember. Ruby learns headbutt. She headbutts Mercury, which makes absolutely zero difference to that battle whatsoever other than probably giving Mercury a mild headache. The poor dude's had his legs amputated, he's not going to be very bothered by some mild discomfort. So how does Volume 6 fix all of this? Well, let me clarify, Volume 6 doesn't fix everything wrong with Ruby's character. She got a little too speech heavy for my taste in the latter half of the volume. Just one would probably have been enough. But boy does Volume 6 do a lot in writing many of the things I've already addressed in this video. It gives me great relief, because disliking Ruby really gave me no pleasure. I'm liking her now more than I ever liked her in the course of the show, which is great. Bless Mills and Carrie for that. Maybe I'll finally buy that dang Ruby figure and finish the display. So what happens in Volume 6? Well, right off the bat, Ruby is so much smarter in this volume, in the smaller and the bigger moments. She has the head of a leader screwed on straight and it's glorious. In the first episode, it's Ruby who quells the justified anger of the rest of her team over Ospin's lies. Note, this isn't because she isn't also deeply disturbed by the fact that Ospin lied to all of them, but she knows it's not the time. There are many civilians on this train, and right now her friends and team are all that stand between those innocent passengers getting to Argus safely or becoming grim fodder. She takes control when no one else is able, and ultimately her cool head saves the train. It's a nice shift in tone and treatment of Ruby as a true leader that thankfully the volume continues well after this episode. She also asks all of the right questions this volume too. Remember that dang question about Osborne's cane being a relic? There's none of that this volume. Ruby asks the meaningful questions, which completely shift the direction of the plot and dynamic between characters. She asks Jin the hardest question, a selfless one too, given that Ruby could have asked about Summer or her silver eyes. What is Ozpin hiding from us? The answer to that question is what she deems the most important and vital to the safety of her team, knowing that the truth could destroy her relationship with Ozpin a powerful ally. Ruby shows herself to be able to think quick on her feet again this volume, even if it means bending the rules a little, like summoning Jim to buy herself more time against Lenny the Leviathan. To buy herself more time against Lenny the Leviathan. Lenny the Leviathan? That's really fucking hard to say. Again, risking the wrath of the spirit within the lamp and a potential ally. Ruby's biggest moments come in the standout Brunswick arc of this volume. These episodes made me absolutely fall in love with Ruby as a character, more so than I'd ever done in the series before. 
Let's look at the little things first before we dive into the juicy stuff with the apathy grim. A really small detail I liked right away was that Ruby is unsure of Brunswick Farms from the get-go. She's seen a lot of settlements on her travels across Mistral that fall into three distinct categories. Operating towns, towns clearly destroyed by grim and bandits, and towns that were only half built. Brunswick Farms is none of these things, and it makes we the audience feel unease right along with Ruby. This place is an unknown setting the show has never tackled before. It's also a nice reminder to the audience that Ruby has done a hell of a lot more travelling on her foot than the rest of her teammates, and has actually learned useful real-world information from those extensive travels. It cements her as a huntress, and is relevant to the plot at that point in the show too. Bonus points, Miles and Kerry. Seeing Ruby learn from her experiences in these smaller moments is really satisfying, but of course Ruby gets a lot of big moments in this spooky arc too. Again, in another strong creative choice by Kruby, this is when they introduce the Apathy Grim for the first time, and it does wonders for reminding the audience that yes, Ruby is an optimist, more so than her teammates. It's why the Apathy has such a hard time affecting her will to go on. But it's not this grating, unhindered optimism like we saw from earlier volumes. Ruby doesn't totally keep her cool here. She gets pretty angry with her uncooperative and defeatist teammates such as her determination to stick to the mission and get the relic to Atlas. When she drops the lamp in fear, she rounds her team up to come with her down into the well, refusing to give in to the doubt that is plaguing her friends. And of course, when the apathy chase them down into the cellar, Ruby's the only one to truly manage to resist their effects. She's able to crawl over to Blake and tries desperately to rouse the rest of the team. She silver eye laser beams those creepy lads not once, but twice with obviously a little help from Maria on the second occasion, and ultimately saves her entire team from a pretty gruesome end. I honestly can't think of a moment in the series until this point that Ruby managed to save the lives of all her teammates in such a fashion, and this was the perfect time for it. Now, I'm not saying I want Ruby Rose saving her teammates in every moment of Jeopardy, hell no. Teamwork absolutely makes the dreams and the memes work, and Ruby isn't a better fighter than Weiss, Blake or Yang, so it wouldn't really make sense either. Actually, what I really appreciate about this particular Ruby saves the day moment is that her victory isn't through her skill in combat, or even her silver eyed abilities, but through her own self-determination, which allowed her to resist the apathy and use her dang silver eyes at all. Without that unwavering will to go on, those glowing eyes in her skull would have been a mute point. And that's what we need to see more of, Ruby playing a vital role in carrying her team not through raw strength, but as an inspiration to them. That's what makes the best leaders at the end of the day. Now, another big thing I want to address in this video is the way in which Ruby confronts others in meaningful ways in Volume 6. Seeing her treat Crow's alcoholism as a genuine problem and danger to the group, as well as offering to be a listening ear should he need it, showed a nice level of maturity we haven't really seen from Ruby, certainly not with the people she cares about. She isn't afraid to call people out when they're at fault, and it's nice that we do see her frustration with Crow manifest in little bursts of anger. It makes her all the more human and believable. Ruby confronts problematic behaviour in her circle when she needs to. She's firm when the situation requires it, like how she deals with Jean's violent outburst against Oscar. John! How do we even know it's really him? What if we've been talking to that liar this whole time? John! I also loved that scene particularly in showing that Ruby really does hold the respect of all her peers, even those who aren't members of her own team. I love her talks with Maria in this volume too, who is also pretty upfront with Ruby's flaws, that she really doesn't give herself enough credit and that isn't a good thing. She needs to recognise and appreciate her own strengths in order to succeed in the battles to come. Now, the mech fight at the end of the volume wasn't my favourite thing ever. There were definitely parts that could have been improved and some cuts that didn't make much sense. Ruby's speech to Cordovan, which I didn't entirely hate, but would have probably liked a lot more if Ruby hadn't already made several motivational speeches before that point in the volume. We're going to Atlas! Bigger people than you have tried to stop us and failed. But we're supposed to be on the same side! We're supposed to use our power to protect people. But you just used yours to look down on everyone. We didn't want to steal from you. We did it because you gave us no other choice. Now I'm giving you one last chance to stand down and hear us out. 
for what it's worth, Lindsay kills it in this scene, and Ruby's plan to jump inside the arm was a good one, if not crazy dangerous. In regards to the silver-eyed warrior ability being too OP, it's an understandable concern for viewers. I do hope that the writers don't overplay Ruby's silver-eyed abilities. I would prefer if there was something similar to My Hero Academia and that powers have limitations and some kind of adverse effect on the user if they go overboard. Maybe Tyrion might actually take one of Ruby's eyes to allow that limitation without having to dive deep into silver-eyed warrior lore. Doing that would allow Ruby to still retain her silver-eyed ability and Thanos Grimm, but also not allow her to obliterate any Grimm in her path and alleviate any sense of threat the Grimm may still come to pose. As long as we don't have any repeats of the Volume 2 finale, please lord have mercy. I'm super interested to see how Ruby handles things in Atlas. It's a completely different beast to any place she's been before, not to mention the potential of a Penny 2.0 and a confrontation with Papa Absolute Shite Schnee. Now that was a tongue twister. <laughs> volume 7 could be a really amazing volume for her and continue to build on the strong framework that Volume 6 gave us. Alright lads, we've reached the end of my script, so we've reached the end of the video. I'm sure there are things I've said in here that you agree and disagree with, but keep it civil in the comments as always. Make sure to check out my other video essays if you haven't already, and subscribe for more of this kind of content. Once again, I want to give my Patreons a big ass high five, without you guys none of these longer projects would be possible. See you all on the flip side, and by that I mean the next video, or you can just follow my rambles on Twitter at YouTube one whatever floats your metaphorical boat.